And now for our weekly news segment. All right. Yeah. So, first article is in ARS Technical One. I think I saw this on Hacker News this morning. Um, suspects can refuse to provide phone passcodes to police court rules. So criminal suspects can refuse to provide phone passcodes to police under U.S. Constitution's Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, according to a unanimous ruling issued today by Utah's state Supreme Court. The question ad addressed in the ruling could eventually be taken up by the U.S. Supreme Court, whether through review of this case or a similar one. So that is definitely good for people mm. who want to, um, you know, not self-incriminate, protect their privacy. Um, even, even if you have nothing, you know, even if you're totally innocent, you don't break any laws, you shouldn't have to unlock your phone, uh, to let, uh, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to be compelled to, to do that. Just simply unlock your phone so that police can look into it. Yeah. Especially yeah, yeah. without being charged with anything or without any warrant. It's like the police coming into your house without a warrant. Right. Um, right. And so this Utah how... court basically protected their fifth amendment right of not, not having to self-incriminate themselves. Hmm. Yeah, I wonder how that compares to right, like federal issues, uh, like when you're when you're going through crossing the border, um, right? There's there's been some instances there, right, where people's people's phones get taken, uh, and then if they're they're locked, uh, I think they can. They well, can what's try. even more interesting about this case is that they did actually have a warrant, um, mm -hmm. and so this case well, had a involves, warrant. yeah, and uh, and. Alfonso Valdez, who was arrested for kidnapping and assaulting his ex-girlfriend. <laughs> Police mm. officers obtained a search warrant for the contents of Valdez's phone, but couldn't crack his passcode. Valdez refused to provide his passcode to a police detective. At his trial, the state elicited, elicited testimony from the detective about Valdez's refusal to provide his passcode when asked. Today's ruling said, and during closing arguments, the state argued in rebuttal that Valdez's refusal and resulting lack of evidence from his cell phone undermined the veracity of one of his defenses. The jury convicted Valdez. A court of appeals reserved the conviction, agreeing with Valdez that he had the right under the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution to refuse to provide his passcode and that the state violated that right when it used his refusal against him in trial. The Utah Supreme Court affirmed the court of the appeals ruling. All so right. it goes even a little bit further. Yeah, so uh, it would be interesting to see if something like this went to the Supreme Court. Um, hopefully they would... They would um, have a have a similar opinion on that but all right good stuff yeah step in the right direction next up uh a tweet from elon musk apparently uh, microsoft word now scolds you if you use words that aren't inclusive so according to uh some new settings in microsoft word and the editor settings there's now a, a thing on that will check words for inclusiveness so insane is not uh inclusive enough uh, so you can't use the word insane, according it's to Microsoft wild. Word. It's it's going to be scary, right? Once once everybody is using AI, and then AI is also uh, going by these by these type of algorithms, right? So now you could you could see um, aside to all the other you know normal options you would have on any other word editor, there's one called inclusiveness. <laughs> Uh, and Elon Musk is ironically calling out Community Notes, which he created uh, for being wrong. Apparently, they said Community Notes said this feature has been available in Microsoft Word since at least 2020 and has to be turned on manually. But I guess Elon Musk didn't turn this on, and it was on by default for him. So they're probably doing a thing where they're they're switching that to be on by default. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, weird stuff. Uh, next up, the Prime Minister of Montenegro now owns Bitcoin. Um, I guess that's interesting. <laughs> okay. Interesting. I, yeah. <laughs> I, did, I just pulled all these news as what was sent to me. Um, yeah. I mean, he, he probably, you know, is rich enough to be able to actually use Bitcoin, uh, unlike okay. all of us uh, plebeians. Okay. What is this one? A uh, CNN article about limiting how often people can travel with carbon passports. So more control under the guise of uh, climate change and you right. know global warming and stuff. Yes. You'll be happy and own nothing. 
Okay. I will not eat the bugs. Hmm. This is one that I think you sent. Uh, Warren's crypto bill is likely unconstitutional. It's also unlikely to pass. Democrat lawmakers signed on to sponsor the Digital Asset Anti-Money Money Laundering Act. The bill is bad for crypto in the U.S., even if it never gets through Congress. As we've seen with pressure uh, that companies seem to fold to before regulation is even passed. Uh, Senator... Warren is trying to force feed the American people a poison pill. The high profile legislator known today as much for her disdain of cryptocurrency as for big banks has submitted a bill for consideration looking to crack down on crypto's alleged use in illicit finance. So it's just going to talk about uh, the, the act that she's sponsoring and yeah, she's basically looking to expand the bank secrecy act, right? And, yeah, and into like more of a, yeah, expand it, and add it to the crypto sector sector right so, so, they would, so they would treat crypto like any other banking activity uh with the know yeah. your customer kyc aml all transactions essentially have to be you know over over a certain threshold you'll have to do reporting and things like that um but to the degree that 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 they you know, then would label label nodes and miners and uh, unhosted wallets as essentially money service providers, right? Essentially, is is I think that the the gist of the bill and its most crazy interpretation. Which yeah, is it's U.S. is just becoming more and more hostile towards cryptocurrencies, and unfortunately, but it's saying here that it's it's unlikely that it would pass, right? What was the, what was the reasoning they gave there? Let me see. I didn't have a chance to read through this whole article. Um, uh, wait, here it is. That said, um, that said, Warren's bill as it exists is unlikely to pass for many of the same reasons U.S. government governance is often hamstrung, partisan politics, infighting, and gridlock. Yeah, there just, there just won't be. But well, as we've seen with recent events, just the threat of regulation that isn't even passed is enough for companies to be compelled to change the way they work and what they offer which is unfortunate but that's just how it is yep well interesting that she's trying so hard but hopefully she she won't have her way so this was crazy story this week um by approving unconstitutional warrantless surveillance of Americans, they've betrayed the American people. We've included a list of all the representatives who voted to pass the National Defense Authorization Act with FISA 702. So this was a big thing this week where uh, there were votes coming up for uh, the NDAA with the FISA 702. And uh, everyone was telling people to call their, call their senators, call their reps. Um, but unfortunately, this passed pretty bipartisan and do you uh do you have that youtube clip that i sent you if we could play part of that Rand paul yeah yeah, Let me yeah so Rand paul is obviously one of the guys that didn't vote for this but uh, he he explains what this is all about this is something that they they slipped into a much a much larger yep they slipped into larger a much larger bill, bill. Uh, extending fisa but if you play his clip it's yeah, long part? you could start at the beginning okay uh and he'll start to explain what the fisa extension even is in the 1960s the fbi spied on martin luther king and other civil rights protesters the fbi spied on vietnam war protesters the church committee was formed in the 1970s and detailed these abuses and the response by congress was to pass something called the foreign intelligence surveillance act or fisa fisa was ostensibly passed to limit spying on americans it was supposed to be a reform but as far as the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act allows government to spy on U.S. citizens without a warrant, it is unconstitutional. As Dr. John Tyler from Houston Christian University points out, the FISA text, the Constitution's text, and the relevant opinions by the U.S. Supreme Court conclusively demonstrate that FISA and its secret ex parte, meaning you only hear from one side in the court, these courts are unconstitutional for three reasons. First, the secret ex parte courts violate the case or controversy requirement of Article 3. Courts are about deciding disputes between two parties. Aren't by, uh, they aren't originated just to say this is a pronouncement. There has to be a dispute. 
And in the FISA court, it's more about having a generalized comment. Second, FISA violates the Fourth Amendment liberties from unreasonable searches and seizures. Third, FISA and its secret ex parte courts violate the due process guarantees of the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment. Dr. Tyler goes on to say that lastly, the Supreme Court has ruled that national security does not require secret courts or justify ignoring the Fourth Amendment liberties. This unconstitutional government spying has been further authorized by adding Section 702 to FISA. That law entrusts America's intelligence agencies with broad authorities supposedly to surveil foreigners abroad. But time has proven again and again that America's intelligence agencies cannot be trusted with this immense power and responsibility. Section 702 expires at the end of this year. We've known this for five years, and yet somehow the Senate has no time to debate this and wishes to simply extend it. Members of Congress anticipated using this deadline as an opportunity not just to make meaningful changes, but to reform FISA generally to better protect American civil liberties. But it doesn't appear to be allowed to happen at this point. Everything's rush, rush, rush. Let's pass it without debate. But they've known for five years it was going to expire at the end of this year, and yet they just want to punt it with the hope that they'll never have to debate it. Extending this Section 702 robs Congress of the ability to make reforms now and likely robs Congress of the opportunity to make reforms anytime in the next year. That means that once again, the intelligence agencies that ignore the constraints on their power will go unaddressed and unpunished. And the warrantless surveillance of Americans in violation of the Bill of Rights will continue. All right, we can leave it there. 702. All right. Yeah, so basically they they snuck in this extension of 702, Section 702 of FISA, which is going to allow the intelligence agencies to continue to illegally, effectively spy on Americans by way yeah, of... It extends their surveillance, or yeah. warrantless surveillance, and expands it. Uh, so, yeah. The grim. They, what, what, what's crazy is shows you how absurd, Paul, like... How useful or useless all, all these legislators are, and they're effectively all bought out. None of them are independent minded. Obviously, Senator Rand Paul is the exception, right? Kudos to him. This guy's this guy's amazing. Yeah, Rand Paul's a um, but but all all the rest pretty much. You know, they just go along with their political party, how they're told to vote. Most of them don't even have time to try to even figure out what these issues are or know about them or I mean, even, it's kind of like that on purpose they'll sneak something have, in and they'll make it hard yeah, to it's too much to like understand such a short yeah, amount of time you i mean the, like so the irony here is right we were just talking about senator warren and how she's trying to push this other bill that would effectively ban crypto right and so she's evil senator warren um but then if you look i think she's one of the people that actually voted against this now, I don't think she voted against it for purposes of that she was against extending FISA 702. She probably voted against it because she disagreed with other elements of this bill. But it just shows you how broken the entire system is, right? So you have... Yeah, Warren's you have, not on here. She voted against it. So, wait, all right, maybe we love Senator Warren. She she voted against this this bill that would have extended uh, 702 of FISA. Uh, so, like, how do you even as a legislator pick and choose what you vote on when essentially every single bill comes with comes with a bunch of crap in it that is completely like freaking unconstitutional. Like you'd have to be voting no to everything essentially uh, if you want to do your job. Is this <laughs> including House and Senate or is this just House? Um, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't say. It doesn't say. I, yeah, I this might just be the both. House. Yeah. It might be both. Uh, I'd have to see a total number. But yeah, uh, your point is definitely valid on that. It's just so yeah that's why we that's why we crypto guys we're 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 opting out because to try to change try things to. i mean we'll, we'll, we, we could try to change things as well but uh, it's better to just ignore opt out build our own system yeah like you know do as much as you can here but like at some point you know it's just there's nothing you can do not to be like grim and doomer uh but there's only and not that you shouldn't try, but there's only so much you can do like within the broken system. Right. So, uh, yeah. So this is also a crazy story this week. 
uh, with uh, everyone, everyone I'm sure heard about this. Wallet drainer code added to Ledger library has crypto on edge. A suspected supply chain attack on Ledger Connect Kit may leave DAP users open to loss of funds. Users of crypto web apps are being warned to avoid the platforms until investigations into a potential cybersecurity incident affecting hardware wallet Ledger play out. Notices of malicious code were shared on social media Thursday morning, found in software libraries for Ledger's Connect Kit, which connects blockchain apps with Ledger devices. Web3-focused cybersecurity firm Blockade told BlockWorks that so far at least $150,000 has been lost as a result of a malicious code slipping into websites in production. Ledger users are not at risk if they refrain from transacting, the firm said. It is not exploitable on prior approvals, uh, the CEO uh, told BlockWorks, noting that many websites are still affected and users are getting hit, so the damage may be more severe. Uh, so essentially, uh, from what I can remember... I don't, doesn't look like they mentioned here. Uh, so they use something called NPM, which is no package manager, which is a package manager for Node.js applications. And no NPM can be dangerous because dependencies are like auto updating and some dependencies can be pulled, like latest versions be pulled live. And so what happened is they, they didn't lock a dependency version and there was a supply chain attack where some package dependency they were using, like some library for something, right? They were using, had a new version that came out that was malicious, but because they didn't lock the previous version that they were on, that was known good. This new version came in and had malware and ended up affecting this application, if that makes sense. What does this mean for hardware wallets in general, you think? Um... This is for hardware wallets in general. I don't think it really means anything because this is with Ledger's Connect Kit, which is connecting with DApps. Mm -hmm. uh, and this doesn't. This shouldn't have all that junk in there in the first place. Yeah, as far as I, from what I understand, this is, doesn't affect. This isn't anything on the actual hardware wallet part, but it's it's using it's with their part where they connect to like um, mm -hmm. Ethereum DApps, basically. And so there was malicious code that was, I guess, stealing people's funds. Yeah, so they're saying do not interact with any dApps for the moment. We'll keep users informed as the situation evolves. Ledger devices and Ledger Live. Yeah, see, Ledger devices and Ledger Live are not compromised. Um, so there's that part. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, it's, it's software there, where people are being careless with how it was set up and security and stuff. And I think, let me see if I can pull it up, but Seth for Privacy had a great, um, as always, had a great thread about that. Yeah, I sent you one other Seth post I wanted to bring up as maybe, maybe the last story. Yeah, I think that's the last one. Uh, yep. So if it's not open source, it's not Freedom Tech. Shockingly, at Keystone, oh, this is, uh, this is different. This is also interesting, but this is different. Let me see if I can find his, uh, I'm pretty sure he had a, a tweet about it. Yep, here it is. Verify your transaction on screen with your hardware wallet or get wrecked. Being Bitcoin only doesn't fix this. Using multi-sig doesn't fix this. Air gap security model doesn't fix this. The real solution is users properly verifying transactions on their hardware wallet screen before signing, incentivizing security reviews and disclosures, devs pinning known good dependency versions, open sourcing all the things. The only thing you as a user have control over is number one. If you're using a hardware wallet without verifying transaction details, you're losing the vast majority of the benefit. If your wallet doesn't have a screen or encourages blind signing by not showing you all the relevant details, details get a new one. Take the time to always verify transaction details before sending. It's worth a few seconds of your time. Ledger library confirmed compromised and replaced with a drainer wait out interaction with any dApps till this thing becomes clear. So yeah, it was an NPM package that that got a supply chain attack basically through a dependency. It's that simple, but it's that big because people were careless and weren't pinning known good versions for something that requires so much security. Mm. So that shows uh, carelessness on, on Ledger's part. Sure. Sounds like people just shouldn't be using Ledger, right? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, there's there's not a whole ton of options for hardware wallets that also support. Um, we got some good Monero things coming down the pipe, though, right? Yeah, we, we got do. we definitely do. Seed signer, right? We have uh, the Sidekick. Um, what else we got? We got a, we got a few things being worked on that are hardware wallet related, right? I hope the uh, I hope the Monero fork for the foundation device would come out. That would be that'd be interesting. Oh right, yeah. So that's so a very Monero, large side project. So 
it would be Monero would get added to Foundation essentially, or somebody would create a new Foundation. There'd be a custom firmware that supports Monero, basically. For That's it. cool. Yeah, um, yeah, I got I this last it. one here. Another another good thread from Seth for privacy. Uh, mm. Privacy on Bitcoin is prohibitively expensive at the moment. Reran the numbers from my old comparing private spends blog post, and at a generously low 150 sats per byte, it would cost you $93.85 oh, to take God. a coin, make it private, and spend it. That's wild. That's, so that's the apples to apples comparison of Bitcoin versus Monero, right? So it costs. Yep. Cost you a fraction of a cent to send Monero, and it's fungible and private every time. If you want to do the same in Bitcoin, it's going to cost you ninety three dollars per transaction. Showing a median of five point six cents, but oh, I, yeah, that's I've never spent more than one cent on a Monero transaction. Um, note that this isn't just about ordinals causing a fee increase, and was always going to be an issue when it comes to requiring Bitcoin privacy to be done entirely at the application level. It just simply costs a lot to gain privacy today on Bitcoin. Note that the lowest possible cost for transaction flow in Bitcoin is 63 cents at uh, one sat per byte. That's if you do slow. Well, full comparison between Bitcoin, Monero, and Zcash. Probably you can read it all in my first ever blog post below. Put 210,000 sats into CoinJoin, get 100,000 back out. It's crazy. Privacy. Yeah, I had, I had Ragnar on Monero Talk this week. We were talking about um, his Finny forum and stuff. We had we had a great convo. He's he's pretty hardcore Monero these days, but he was a, he's an OG Bitcoiner. Uh, we we had I don't know some stupid drama back in the past that caused him to block me for like three three years. So I actually didn't know much about him. So it was a great convo because I got to learn about him because I, I never really saw Ooh, him. Well, at least. Uh... Um, but I was I was trying to like you know because my he he comes from the Bitcoin he's a big Bitcoin privacy community guy right and like my my not I wouldn't say gripe but my I, I I what I don't understand about the Bitcoin privacy stuff is like like why 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 put our efforts there if it's just broken and not working uh, if effectively you have to pay a hundred dollars per transaction in Bitcoin to to turn it into fungible money or private money. Why is so much effort being put there and applauded for trying to make Bitcoin yeah. private when yeah. it doesn't work? Like just just move to Monero. Like I mean even by itself, like just using Bitcoin non privately is already prohibitively expensive for like almost like all of right. the actual use cases you'd want to use for Monero or Bitcoin. Um which Monero is you know provides actual value there. Uh, it's just I gotta have the samurai wallet guys back on the show. I mean, I I, I applaud them for all they do, uh, their efforts. They, you know, if you're gonna use Bitcoin, um, go go down the, the that route, right, to try to make it private. But I also just don't really understand why those efforts are even put in. I don't know. I think you... it's it's starting to get like more and more diminishing as time goes on these efforts for bitcoin privacy just as as time as the blockchain itself becomes less and less usable the the returns are more and more diminishing and like yeah like there's an understanding that yeah bitcoin's big and trying to push privacy on bitcoin is like could help the most amount of people but mm. the underlying right. system itself That's is just important. so broken and people refuse to it's like co-opted and people refuse to actually improve the base layer it's not going to help anything at this point but and if you, as you can if, see go ahead sorry sorry go ahead it's not 90 no one's going to pay no noob right no no average person if you're trying to reach more average people for privacy it's going to pay 93 dollars to make right. your bitcoin private it's just not happening right so so yes theoretically you could reach more people because there's a lot more bitcoiners than monero people but the best thing to do would just to move those people into monero or get them to use Monero for purpose for these purposes, uh, rather than using uh, these these workaround solutions. So, like with Samurai, I know there was talk of adding Bitcoin to Monero atomic swaps. So well, actually, I think it's happening, but I think it's only for purposes of like obfuscating your toxic change, right? It's not like they're natively adding Monero, and you could hold your Monero on the wallet, and then you could swap in and out of Bitcoin to Monero. Like I don't know why they just don't go all in and like promote yeah. Monero as the as the tool for privacy, you know. If they did that, I would be I'd, I'd be a lot more interested. 
Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Great stuff. Good job. Especially considering uh, you were learning things as you were going through them. Yeah, I almost never get to look at any of these before <laughs> I just open them and I'm just... Uh, You're good, man. You're uh, good. Uh, but yeah, that was right. pretty much it for the news this week.